Good evening. My name is Yvette Davis. I am the director of the Popol Shaw Center for Race and Ethnicity. And we are so happy that you have decided to join us this evening. This Black History Month event is co-sponsored by the Popol Shaw Center, along with alumni relations at Dickinson College. Through the power of collective minds, we have spirited back three Pennsylvania abolitionists, authors, and entrepreneurs. Joining us this evening from the past will be Mrs. Frances Ellen Watkin Harper, Mr. Henry Watson, and Mr. William C. Goodridge. Our subject matter for this event is Pathways to Progress, from Freedom and Education to the value of the vote. And at this time, I would like to welcome our distinguished abolitionists. And we thank you so much for allowing us to spirit you back into the 21st century here at Dickinson College to share your experiences, your wisdom, and your stories. So let us jump right in. If our distinguished guests could enter our space and join us. Comes creeping in the room, you better hush, 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 hush. Somebody's calling my name, you better hush, 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 hush. hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush, 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 hush. Somebody's calling my name. Crying, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, oh Lord. Song of the Underground Railroad, signifying simultaneously the signal to the freedom seekers, the acknowledgement of the dead, and the plea to the ancestors to call my name when it's time for me. I am Henry Watson, Chambersburg, born 1834, transcended from this plane in 1892. I have the privilege of being your interlocutor for the evening. May I present? Miss Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Names are important, and I have four of them. I've earned them in all of my living. Born free, just south of the Mason-Dixon line in Baltimore, Maryland. Educated by my uncle, because I was orphaned by the time I was three by both parents. I grew to abandon the literal term of hush. No, 
I would speak out as an abolitionist, as a champion for human rights and equality. I left this plane in 1911. That body rests in Philadelphia. My name is William C. Goodrich, station master on the Underground Railroad and entrepreneur. I was born in 1806 in Baltimore. My mother worked on the Carroll Plantation, and we all know Mr. Carroll was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Now, I don't take about what, talk about when this body left this earth. But it was sometime around 1876. 1876. What a year for us to lose Mr. Goodrich. The very year that Mr. Samuel Randall, Speaker of the House of the United States Congress, cast the deciding vote to remove federal troops from the South. And thus, Reconstruction, the great American experience for justice, liberty, and freedom for all imploded, and we fell back, as the Hindus say. They have a term, it's called the Great Kali Yuga, falling backwards into darkness from which you cannot see what you have left or where you will end. This is a story we will weave through our conversation with you. It's a kind of a coincidence, madame. I was, too, was born on the Carroll Plantation. My mother was a free woman. She was married to an enslaved man, and thus she stayed near the Carroll Plantation when I was born so that she could share time with him. But Frances, as you know, it was very dangerous for her as a free uh, person to stay in the climate of enslavement. And my father convinced her that we should flee to Pennsylvania and to Chambersburg and practice the generosity of the Gradual Abolition Act so that I may gradually become manumitted. Thus, I am what is referred to as a manumission. However, I slipped away myself before my 27th birthday from my freedom. May we sit? Thank you. Gentlemen, be seated. Madame. Good sir, good lady, good sir. It is an honor and a pleasure for us to be in the presence of such an august group of speakers, sojourners, and freedom seekers. So we're going to begin with our first question for each of you. What was your pathway to freedom and to education? Share with us your journeys. My pathway to freedom is actually education. Mm -hmm. I was out of my misfortune of having lost my parents so early, I had the fortune 
of being educated in my uncle William Watkins schoolhouse, the William Watkins Academy for free Negro youth. Thus, education being legally allowable for those who were free, born free in my case, a lineage of free people. As I was seated in my uncle's schoolroom, my chair in the midst of a room full of boys was often by the window where I could isolate and insulate myself from all of their chatter. I loved words. I loved Latin. I loved the principle of liberty because I could hear through that open window the chains, the screams of people being bartered and sold, of families being torn apart. I was not even 12, but keenly aware of what enslavement, the lack of access to liberty, to liberation, could do to a person, to a family, to an entire race of people. So through my education, I was able to write. I have hundreds of works published, which I used the money from that to help with the Underground Railroad and to help give voice to the cause of universal equality and liberation for all. Here, 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 here. So that was my pathway, the beginning of my journey. And it was a very complicated and complex journey for a Negro woman. I did not marry until very late in life. So I was not even attached, given value that comes through marriage, the attachment to a male. And that was quite fine with me. But midway during my path, I encountered the loss of my husband, then our property, and everything, my home and my hope. But oh, for education, I could pick up the pen and write again, and lecture, and go and cause Great agitation. Great agitation. agitation. And that was also part of my pathway to freedom. Good. Education and agitation. It reminds me, Madame, of our dear friend, Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who said, agitate, agitate, agitate. Mr. Goodrich, your path. My path was a bit different than yours because I was born enslaved. As I mentioned earlier on the Carroll Plantation. Now my mother worked in the kitchen. And when she was with child, Mr. Carroll sent her to Baltimore, which is why I was born in Baltimore. Now there have been people who said Mr. Carroll may have been my father. I never knew who my father was. But around the age of six, I was sent across that invisible line, the Mason and Dixon line, that pretty much determined north from south. So coming from a slave state to a free state after the Gradual Abolition Act, I lived with a reverend and Mrs. Dunn. They taught me how to read. <laughs> they taught me how to write. But my job was to work in their tanning shop. But around uh, about the age of 16, the tanning business went under. 
and I was set free. I was given a Bible and a set of clean clothes because that was the rule then. And I traveled on to uh, Lancaster County and I learned a new trade and that trade was barbering. I was quite good at it. Indeed. In fact, many of the men I shaved, white, would say their skin was smooth as a baby's bottom. <laughs> But I traveled back to York, and I turned a one-chair barbershop into the tallest, yes, and I like to say most important emporium in York. I am, uh, using your vernacular, the day built the first skyscraper. It was about uh, four and a half stories tall. Indeed. Miss <laughs> Francis would have to hold her I bonnet quite impressive to the top the of it. Yes, indeed. But in that emporium, I sold just about everything. I became quite wealthy. In fact, in your dollars and cents, I would have been a millionaire or a billionaire today. That was a path. But unlike my other two friends here, I was the station master on the Underground Railroad. And I often used my home in my emporium to help people get, those freedom seekers get to freer space. So many times I tell new people when I meet them, I am one to bring together the Underground Railroad and the Overground Railroad because Indeed. I own 13 rail cars. And one of my rail cars had a fake bottom where I could hide a freedom seeker during the day, but we all know that a bounty was always on my head. Indeed. <laughs> mm. But that was my path, my pathway to freedom. That bounty always on your head, sir, reminds me of how I might answer the question, madame, of my pathway to freedom. Because as I said, my mother was born free in the Carroll plantations, Mr. Carroll plantations, but my father was enslaved. Thus, I was born in a precarious situation that I too might practice what one might call freedom or file back into the great institution of slavery, which is why my mother moved us in 1834 after my birth to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, madam. It was a lucky time for me because Mr. Thaddeus Stevens, who at that time had been senator and a House of Representative here in Pennsylvania, had passed the Pennsylvania Education Act for free public education. It was passed in 18. Oh, so it was passed in 1832. Mm. Now, Mr. Goodridge and I were having a conversation about the difference between legislation and administration. Hmm. Because one can legislate for change, but unless there is effective administration of that change, and I might add also compliance to that change, the legislation means nothing if you do not have an army on the streets of compliance. So it was not until 1842 that we actually had access, madame, to public schools, barns, sheds, basements, places that were ordained as public schools, but had little access to resources or the tools 
one might have. Madame, you ask me about my pathway to freedom, and I am still on that pathway to freedom. Mm. I yeah. was born and I died on that pathway to freedom. And one of the reasons why I have come back to join you is I see the struggle mm. is still going on and you too are still on the pathway to freedom. Being a member of what was referred to as the tonsorial arts, that means I was a barber also. My barber shop was in Chambersburg, four houses from the main square. Do you know at that time, black barbers were a pathway to economic vitality and to upward mobility. However, our clients were white men. Black men were not allowed to come to black barber shops. If you were a black child or a black man, you had your hair cut by Uncle someone, fill in the name for yourself. <laughs> you sat on a tub or a wooden box. The primary practitioners of the tonsorial arts of the time were African American men, their, their clients or their community were wealthy white men of the day. And may I add, Mr. Watson, we listened as we were shaving. We, at least I did, Mr. Watson, because I became quite wealthy. I listened to how did they make money. I listen to the politics of the day, which allowed me to inform the superintendents, the agents, the conductors, and the passengers on the Underground Railroad of the political climate of the geographical places. Oh, they laughed and talked and shared their politics as though we were invisible. And it made me a possibility to help in a different way by passing that same information on to superintendents and agents. And here, if you do not mind, Madame and Madame, I, I might add we are talking about freedom, but I feel it is important for me to define how a man or woman became free. The first way was through what was called manumission. Mm -hmm. Now, manumission was the promise, emphasis added on the word promise, of freedom for an act, a deed, or a gift of service to the master so great that he or she would promise in their will that upon their death, you would be free. There were loopholes and exceptions, sir. The family could claim that the deceased madame had debts to them, and therefore you were sold for those debts. Well, the family could say that there was no witness, as with the case of my father. And thus he was retrieved, as history says. Hmm. The second was called co-artation, ma'am. My dear friend Stephen Smith and his wife are an example of coartation. Coartation was to purchase your freedom or someone else's freedom at fair market value. The dear Stephen Smith, also a very, very wealthy man, fled to his own freedom 
built the possibility for him to purchase his wife's freedom and eventually his children's freedom. There was one caveat, Madame, and that was if you were freed in Maryland, Virginia, mm -hmm. West Virginia, Kentucky, you had 30 days to leave the state and you had to decide whether to leave your family and those things mm. behind. The third w way to be free is really dubious. Madame is called contraband. It applies specifically to the period of the Civil War when the North was invading the South in particular at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation and enslaved people of the battle when the Union was victorious would fall behind the army for safety. Can you imagine hundreds and sometimes thousands of people behind a regiment for safety? Mm. They did domestic work and menial things mm. for the Union Army. The mm. fourth model is called emancipation, which was the least respected. And the, and the legislation, in fact, was very difficult for compliance. Emancipation means that someone federally decides to take your property from you. And thus, you must release, relinquish that property. So we're mm. products of different. One who was born free, one who was manumitted, one who was co-artated. Mm. But we are all, madame, wow. all still on, still on that journey. That journey to freedom. Indeed. Thank you so much, Mr. Watson, Mrs. Harper, and Mr. Goodrich. As you have so eloquently shared with us, our freedom is still fragile. We are still fighting to maintain the vote. And as we say in the 21st century, there is an election every six months. And as we shift the conversation a little bit, uh, we would like you to share your experience with the vote in your time, as well as giving some insight about the fragility of our democracy today. And if Mrs. Harper, if you could begin. Yes. So, I was born in 1825, and this notion of voting for blacks, black men, uh, for women, it was far off. It was not in the forefront for me. I was an abolitionist. And as you all were listening and were able to tell your stories and act on them, administer, I was listening and I would respond through writing. So I would write and write and when that meeting of women's suffrage just happened in, in 1848 in Seneca Falls. We often hear that that is the birthplace of the uh, women's right movement. I challenge that. The birthplace of the right to vote was really about the right to freedom. Mm. The, the women's equality movement wasn't all about just voting. It was about protecting our bodies. It was about temperance. And temperance, which was not just about abstaining from alcohol, but it was about the preservation of a woman's safety for when the men drank. They were prone to abusive behaviors. It was about the right 
to own property, and even the right to divorce for a woman. So the suffrage movement and the right to vote was layered. It was complicated. It cannot be extracted from all of those other um, causes for agitation. So I was a mere 22 when the first meeting occurred. That was local. It was Seneca Falls was really decided in a few days to gather people, women together, and men. And our dear friend, Mr. Douglas, I believe he was the only uh, black male there. And Sojourner Truth was there. But the seed was planted and more focused agitation on getting the right to vote for women really took root. But along that journey, by 1866, when I was invited to the 11th convention, an, an annual gathering of the Women's uh, Right Association, there was a rift, very definitely. Who should get the right to vote? Yes, I remember that. Mm. Should it be the black men over women? And within that question, the layers continue to peel away. And you see the fractioning of the movement of the agitation for women to get the right to vote. White women, many of them, were appalled at the idea, accosted that black men would get the right to vote before them. And that would surely cause the demise of our society for well, many reasons. And then as a black woman, I was totally left out of the equation. Indeed. So the fracture occurred. And that was the beginning, too, of the establishment of a separate and definitely not equal organizations around gaining this right to vote. So black women established their own state and regional and national associations to support and resource the right for black men to vote first. It was sacrificial. For with the passing of the 14th Amendment, the doors opened for black men to vote, but I could see very clearly that it was shutting for black women. Indeed, madam. It is a tragic story you tell. We, as Pennsylvanians, love to, uh, what is the word, make a clarion call for the franchise as the fourth state in the Union to ratify the 15th Amendment and the seventh state in the Union to ratify the 19th. But the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, and the 19th Amendment ratified in 1920 were bookends to a 50-year period, which you call Jim Crow, mm -hmm. which impacted the ability to administrate the legislation for our vote, to consecrate voting sites. This is why our dear friend Octavio Cahill was shot in the streets of Philadelphia in 1872, one block away from Mother Bethel Church, because he was registering people to mm. vote. Mm. So Francis is, is humble. 
but the women of her time set her to a terrible challenge. They said, are you a black woman or are you a black woman? You must take a side. She said, I stand with the origins of myself. She said, I feel I am something of a novice upon this platform, born of a race whose inheritance has been outrage and wrong. Most of my life has been spent in battling against those wrongs. We are all bound up together in this one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest member without receiving the curse in its own soul. You tried that in the case of the Negro, and for centuries, two of them, you pressed him down. This grand and glorious revolution which has commenced will fail to reach its climax to success until throughout the American Republic, the nation shall be so colorblind as to know no man by the color of his skin or the curl of his hair. Well, I do not believe that giving the woman the ballot is immediately going to cure all of the ills of life. I do not believe that white women are dewdrops just exhaled from the skies. You white women speak here of rights. I speak of wrongs. Well, I tell you that 11th gathering of the National Women's Rights Convention was not the same. And we're still struggling. Hmm. I hear that still division hmm. for that essential right that is so powerful, that right to vote, vote that so many have died for. So many. When I think of the right to vote, I first must think of citizenship. Mm, hear, hear. Mm. Those freedom seekers who came through my station simply wanted to be citizens, simply wanted to be treated like every white man, every white woman and child. So when I think of the right to vote, I think of building citizenship. I think of the steps that it takes for someone to walk with dignity. Then I was fortunate to make a fortune. But it did not come easy. Not at all. There were many when I built my emporium that said, why or how could a black man own the tallest building, something as simple as that. But uh, I am often reminded that hmm, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, I still built the tallest building. So just being treated fairly, just being able to know everyone when you walk into that booth to vote, that you are equal to every other person here, here. who walks into that. That is the only time many of us find any form of equality. Hmm. My vote is equal to yours only then. So someone like Octavia, to be killed for the right to vote. And so many are not taking that opportunity today. Oh, mm. sir. I read the papers mm. when 
I'm spirited back. I read all kinds of things. And sometimes it makes me cry because we work so hard to be equal citizens under whatever the law is. This notion, sir, of citizenship reminds me of our dear friend Thomas Morris Chester mm. of Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, mm. New Orleans, London, mm. St. Petersburg, mm. and York, mm. the York in England and Ireland. Chester called a congregation of African-American men from across the state of Pennsylvania to Harrisburg on January 15th of 1863. Mm. Our purpose was to examine the Emancipation Proclamation and write a response from the freemen of Pennsylvania. Hmm. But you would Lincoln. call a brown paper today. Yes. Or a white paper. A white paper, paper, they would call it today, sir. I think so. Uh, uh, we read very carefully the Emancipation Proclamation when it was discussed in September of 1862. We held our ears to the ground in August of 1862 when Governor Curtin secretly set up a meeting, madame, which is called the Governor's Conference in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Governors from all of the northern states secretly convened on the platform in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Our own governor went to Altoona, came out, stood on the platform, tipped his hat, which signaled gentlemen from every corner of the station to gather to discuss whether Curtin could deliver Mr. Lincoln enough votes to pass the Emancipation Proclamation. Hmm. So January 1st was a no, um, uh, Accident, madame, or, or uh, it, it was a planned, strategic step. You know, there is a night called Watch Night. It is the night of December 31st when African Americans across the country stood. But the myth that has come down is it was a religious experience. And it is true that we gathered in churches because they were the safest place for us to meet at the time. But we were watching to see the response of the South, and more important, the response of the northern states to the Emancipation Proclamation. The proclamation, madame, had several flaws. To us, the most important flaw was there was no mention or acknowledgment of the existence of a free man. Mm. Not a word in the Emancipation Proclamation mm. discusses the condition of the free man or its quicksand mm. of citizenship. And so we sent 70 representatives to Mr. Lincoln Mr. Lincoln to ask him to write into the Emancipation Proclamation some reference to citizenship, to justice, to equity, to parity. Hmm. Mr. Lincoln offered us $500,000, ma'am, to organize ships to Africa if the um, Five million enslaved people were free. Can you imagine how many ships you would need? Uh, I, for one, spoke at that meeting and said that my family had been here from Senegambia and 
for 100 years. And if you ask me where to go home, I would simply go back to Baltimore. Uh, so yes. it was a challenge, Madame, when we came back. We did not achieve any change. But Mr. Lincoln did promise that as of March 1, he would allow the inscription of African-American men into the Union armies, mm. thus 180,000 freemen and freedmen joined the United States Colored Troops and served there. Mm. What the, does that have to do with the vote? Well, there is the ballot that we place in the box and there's the, the opportunity that we place before the nation. I voted in Franklin County, but my work was really to agitate through the central Pennsylvania and the counties that followed Route 11 and 15 and 30 and 22 and 322, which were our roots of the Underground Railroad. And to go out and advocate for mm. men and women to take that scary opportunity to place their ballot in mm -hmm. the box. I come back today shocked to find your statistics. Did mm. you know that one statistic of today is that young people between the ages of 18 and 25 do not practice their franchise to near their 25th birthday? Mm. Imagine and how the many changes could be made. And thank you so much for that wonderful segue. As our time is winding down, and thank you so much for all of your insights. And since we are beginning to wind down this session, could you each briefly share your call to action for those of us in the 21st century? Oh. Ms. Harper, would you begin? Yes, I, my call to action. May I share? Yes, ma'am. And briefly, yes. Is that my vision for equity, for liberation, that my work was not in vain, and that the call in one of my most famous poems, probably in your time, but it is what um, started me on this pathway in 1850 as people as were deputized to anyone they thought was a freedom seeker. You were required by law take them, turn them in, and they could be sold further south. But um, upon that and seeing a man brutalized because of the Fugitive Slave Act, I said, make me a grave wherever you will, mm. on a lofty plain, mm. on top of a hill. Make it among Earth's humblest of graves but not in a land where men are slaves. Bury me not in a land where men are slaves. So, I was buried, and the Emancipation Proclamation made us all free. Mm. Mm. Really? Mm. I don't think so. Mm. Mm. Mr. Goodrich. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Harper. And Mr. Goodrich, before you share, 
We have a question from someone who is watching from outside this space. In our time, we call that a virtual audience member who's coming in through YouTube. I we understand gaggling. that. Are they gaggling? Yes, they are gaggling. gaggling. They're gaggling. They're gaggling. Yes. They're gaggling, yes. Oh, googling. So, Being transcendentalists, yes. if we, you know, we, we understand the methodology yes. of transportation. Yes. So the question, the question is, can you all share ways that you held on to your dignity and hope throughout the ordeals of your life? especially as rights were stripped away. And Mr. Goodridge, if you would begin, we would appreciate it. Well, it was tough. It was very tough. Mm -hmm. But because I had the opportunity to see those who traveled through my station it made me think. It made me feel, for what reason am I living? To speak words that no one will listen to, no matter how loud I shout them. Hey, to throw up dates and events and be referred to as a good person. But for what reason am I actually living? Is to see citizenship. Mm. Stand tall. Mm. Because when citizenship stands tall, we all stand tall. Indeed. Mm. It wasn't easy. But my children and my wife, Evelina, mm. helped. My son became daguerreotypist. My daughter had beauty shops that predated Madam C.J. Walker. My daughter was considered Madam Nichols. Oh. <laughs> so, how did I manage? <laughs> I just took one step and put it in front of the other, and then put another one in front of that, and it works. Hmm. Indeed, sir. Remember, remember voting. Mm. Is the only way in this Americas of the United of the States, and they say because York was the first capital of the United States, change is only going to happen in that first part you talked about, and that's legislation. Mm. So continue, mm. moving forward, one step in front of the other. Mm. Sir, you bring up justice. In your time, you had a superhero. I believe you called him Superman, in fact. And the announcer of your time referred to him as the champion of truth, justice, and the American way. And from my place beyond, I pondered on why we had the conjunction truth, justice, and the American way. Because I always thought the truth and justice was the American way. And therefore, why must we separate? But I've come to watch and discover that truth and justice must always be vigilant for the bridge to the American way. Mm. My parents, Madame, my mother, and the extended family in Chambersburg voted in Pennsylvania when I was born. African Americans who owned land had the right to vote in Pennsylvania in 1838 until the Constitution was changed. 
So African-American men lost their citizenship in 1838. And it took until 1870 for them to regain it. That was an act of reparation. But it also reminded us that the franchise is a very fragile thing. And we must be vigilant soldiers mm. to protect that franchise. We built after 1870 until 1896 when the Constitution was changed again and required us to take tests to vote. Mm -hmm. So I've come to tell you that your vote is a fragile thing. And unless you are vigilant, mm. unless you rise up and resist the change, and the only way is at the ballot box, madam. Indeed. Uh, so we're concerned about the discussion of wokeness. Hmm. What is the solution? To be asleep? Hmm. Hmm. Is that the model? <laughs> uh, we are beyond that we are not asleep. We are watching. Hmm. We are hoping. And we are praying that truth and justice becomes the American way. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say that, and we, moving forward, we must use what we have access to. For me, it was the pin, but also lifting as we climb, mm -hmm. gathering together, like I did with Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells to create organizations like the Negro Association for Women so that we link arms. Mm. And we are much stronger when we stand together. Yes, we are. And we might ask you, as we transcend again, to use your gaggle. That Google. Google. I, I, you use, you use your Google. Google. That Google. And, and Google the Colored Convention movement, mm -hmm. a movement from 1838 to 1914 of educated, affluent activists from the African-American community, defeats the myth of illiteracy and slumber. And there you will find many more like us who rose up with the blood-stained banner mm, mm, for freedom, justice, Amen. and the American way. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Goodridge, Mr. Watson, and Mrs. Harper, before you depart from us, is there anyone who would like to ask our panelists any questions? We have a couple minutes. Mr. Bivens. Well, I, 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 would, I would very, very quickly do a roll call. William Stills, Pennsylvania. Mm. Philadelphia, Barber. John Wright, York, Barber. William Goodrich, York, Barber. William Whipple, Lancaster, Barber. Henry Watson. Chambersburg, Barber. Jacob Compton, Harrisburg, Barber. William Nesbitt, Altoona, Barber. George Vashon, Pittsburgh, Barber. What do they have all in common? They were all agents of the Underground Railroad. Hmm. And another piece of fact, the number one business, independent business, when I read your papers and magazines today, the number one business, independent business, for black Americans are barbershops and salons. Mm. Mm. They were ours as well. 
our is as well. We succeeded to purchase land, elevate, and start black enterprise. But bad eye, very quickly, black enterprise is the next conversation that you should transport us down to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Because the notion of black enterprise, we are shocked to come back to find out that your eighth ward is gone. Your, uh, in Harrisburg, where 1,100 families and 500 businesses gone through eminent domain. Seventh Ward, Philadelphia, gone. MacArthur's Town, Pittsburgh, gone, all through eminent domain. So we must, in another forum, talk about after citizenship, economic stability, and the achievement of the full pleasures of, of your life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. May we have your commitment. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for a beautiful evening. Soon one morning, when this world is over, I'll fly away to a land on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly So before we conclude, conclude, I want to thank Stephanie Asper, Associate Director of Alumni Relations, my dear colleague, co-conspirator, and friend, for collaborating with us to make this evening possible. Many thanks to you. Mr. John Bivens, our distinguished photographer, who has come all the way over from Harrisburg in this weather uh, to be with us to, do, to share his wonderful gifts. So grateful to you for being here. And thank you to all of you who are here in person, those of you who logged on uh, via YouTube. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a blast for me, at least. Um, it has been wonderful to have uh, Henry Watson, uh, embodied by Mr. Lenwood Sloan, Francis Ellen Watkins Hartburg, embodied by Ms. Sharia Ben, and Mr. William C. Goodridge, embodied by Mr. Kelly D. Summerford. It has been a wonderful experience with these wonderful living history interpreters, all members of the Pennsylvania Past Players, Mr. Lenwood Sloan being the executive director and founder. Thank you for this last Black History Month event hosted, co-hosted by the Popelshaw Center for Race and Ethnicity. Y'all get some food, even if it's a midnight snack. Travel safely to wherever you plan to go after you leave here. And once again, thank you for being with us tonight. Well, yes, I started my second year, January 6th. <laughs>
See, Stephanie isn't sharing all the times when I've gone to her office just so that I could let my head pop off. She has, she has talked me off the ledge. She has kept me from putting my hands in places they shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for your support. I greatly appreciate it. Indeed, yes. So